I'm Chris Schultz. I'm a senior project manager with Milwaukee Metropolitan Sewerage District. Uh, in our planning, research, and sustainability division. I've been in that division only for like the past six years, even though I just hit my 30th anniversary with MMSD about a month ago. Uh, I spent about 25 years or so prior to that working in our water quality protection division, doing a lot of um, regulatory work, managing our field monitoring department that Samples local industry, samples groundwater, does that sort of data collection type of stuff. Somewhere around 2010, I started working across divisions on a program known as our Regional Green Roof Initiative because when we, um, when I say we, MMSD really started getting involved with sustainability um, with both feet jumping in. Uh, we hired a sustainability manager that did not have any staff. So I became partial staff working across divisions. Um, so I did that from about 2010 until 2015 or so. And then in 2016, I moved over into this division uh, permanently. So I wear several hats at the district. Um, for what it's worth, we will be reorganizing yet again in 2022. So we will know. The P from PRS, Planning, Research, and Sustainability, will be breaking away from us, and we will become Integrated Watershed Management Division. Probably way more than anybody needs to know about that. But um, I'm a longtime district employee um, doing the green infrastructure stuff in some way, shape, or form for about 10 or 11 years, but um, the last five or six kind of full time. So here is what I am going to talk about this evening. I'm going to talk a little bit about MMSD. And I guess um, this is where I, th I should throw in some caveats that some of the stuff that I talk about is really only pertinent to our service area and perhaps only available to residents in our service area. But the principles that I'll talk about still apply. Um, so I'm gonna talk about managing where it falls. That's kind of our mantra when we talk about green infrastructure. We wanna manage water where it falls because if we don't, we're gonna to have to manage it somewhere else. Um, then we're gonna talk about what everybody can do on their, uh, on their property. Um, we believe in collective action. We talk to a lot of audiences. Um, it's not uncommon for us to be talking at the residential level. <laughs> we do that all the time because every drop counts is another one of our mantras. Um, and then last of all, I'll talk about other things that you can do besides green infrastructure that are good for water and good for the planet. So let me jump in. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I will try desperately not to mess around with my microphone, that's a nervous habit. But I've had several audiences say, <laughs> type into the chat, Stop touching your microphone. So, so far, so good. Um, so MMSD, we are often confused um, with some other local entities. We are actually a regional government agency um, created by state charter. And the two primary things we do that we're charged with is to provide water reclamation and flood management. So we are not um, the city of Milwaukee Water Department. Those are the people that distribute the water to people's houses. We are the people that do stuff with the water once it's in the sewers and comes to us. So a lot of times I'll have a slide up that, that kind of shows the water treatment cycle. And it's just a circle that goes from the water, goes from the land to, um, to our water reclamation facility back out into the lake where it is eventually taken up by the water department and distributed. And that's kind of the water treatment cycle, at least in Milwaukee. Um, so again, uh, the two main things that we do is we provide water reclamation. We, we no longer use the term wastewater treatment. I may inadvertently use that term because I've been around for 30 years and that's the term we used to use for the majority of that. But we are really trying to focus now on um, everything is a resource. Uh, there is no such thing as wastewater. There are nutrients in there that we can use. There's energy we might be able to harness. 
There's all kinds of things that we can do. So we, we view that as reclaiming the water, not treating wastewater. So um, that's kind of our new nomenclature and I will try my best to stick with that. Uh, but we also charge with flood management. So people say, um, well, why does MMSD flu do flood management? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Um, one is we do have some regional authority when, and when water falls on the ground, it doesn't care about municipal boundaries and um, jurisdictions and such. Water's gonna go where water goes. And that picture on the right, um, I believe is from a flood, uh, maybe in the late 90s or early 2000s. And I also believe that's, that's um, in Wauwatosa near State Street, or at least that's what it looks like to me. And anytime water floods like that, and it gets into someone's house and into their basement, um, that water is coming to us, to the picture on the left, because everybody has a floor drain in their basement. So if we don't manage floods, um, we're gonna end up with that water coming to us one way or another. So it behooves us to be proactive with that. But a lot of people don't know um, that we're actually charged with that. And we have jurisdiction over certain parts of some of the surface waters and the three main rivers that lead out to Lake Michigan. So who are we or who do we serve? Uh, we have over a million customers, approximately 1.1. 1 .1. Um, we serve all or part of 28 different municipalities. Um, all, of, all of Milwaukee County, I'm making the assumption that my cursor is showing up on the screen. Okay, so all of Milwaukee County, except for this little notch down here, which is South Milwaukee. Uh, the reason they are not part of MMSD is they have their own water treatment plant. They don't call it a reclamation facility, so I'll use their terminology. Um, so they treat their own water um, and it doesn't come to us. They're the only municipality in Milwaukee County that does that. And then this ring of suburbs um, up in Ozaki, Washington, out to Waukesha and a small part of Racine County um, comes to us. And then there's a subcontinental divide out near Calhoun Road and such out, out to the west where water naturally goes into a different watershed and goes to the Fox River and ultimately down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so that's kind of what determines where that boundary is. Uh, I will draw your attention to this cross hatched area here. Um, that is the central older part of Milwaukee and it also encompasses a little bit of shorewood here. Um, without getting super sewer nerdy and too far down the rabbit hole, um, that's our combined sewer area, which means there's only one pipe in the ground conveying both wastewater, sanitary waste from people's houses when people are using their garbage disposal, flushing the toilet, um, come industrial wastewater, all of that. And then is, that same pipe is also conveying storm water, anything that falls on the ground. So it's about 5% of our service area, but it has a dramatic impact on who we are and how we operate. Because when it starts raining really hard, the flows to the Jones Island reclamation facility go up very quickly. Whereas we have a second facility down in Oak Creek um, that services all of this outside ring of suburbs um, that operates very differently. So there's some art and there is some science to operating our, our pretty complex conveyance system, our sewer system. Um, well, why are we going to want to manage water where it falls? For all these reasons in the bullet points here. Um, flooding is bad for reasons that I mentioned earlier. Uh, plus, it can damage nature and it can, it can damage streams by scouring vegetation. And then that becomes a downward spiral um, of erosion and water going in places that we don't want it. <clears throat> basement backups. Basement backups are no good for anybody. Uh, nobody wants water in their basement. And then again, it's going to come to our reclamation facility. So we're gonna have to deal with it anyways. When, um, 
when we do get super heavy rains and the sewer system fills up and our deep tunnel system fills up, um, sometimes we have to have combined sewer overflows. That is like a pressure relief valve on the sewer system that is designed to prevent water from going into people's basements. Just like on your water heater, you got that little valve that will pop so the water heater doesn't go shooting through your roof like it does in the Allstate commercial or whatever commercial that was. Um, but we wanna manage water where it falls too because we don't want it carrying pollution away. Uh, when I was talking a couple of slides ago and I showed that cross hatched area of the combined sewer area, um, the one good thing about that area is everything that falls on the ground there will go to the Jones Island water reclamation facility. So all of this junk in this picture down on the lower left will end up getting some sort of treatment and before that water goes out to Lake Michigan via surface water. Um, whereas 95% of our service area, that's not the case because there's a separate storm sewer. So anything on the ground is going to go to the nearest surface water. And ultimately, if you're in our service area, it's gonna end up in Lake Michigan. So I am constantly, when I'm talking to school kids, saying one of the best things that you can do for water quality is don't litter. If it's on the ground, it's gonna end up in Lake Michigan. And where does our drinking water come from? Lake Michigan. Um, and it's just good for water quality for all of the reasons that I mentioned uh, previously. This picture in the upper right is a pretty famous picture that used to show up on the news and in the newspaper all the time. Um, because anytime we did have a combined sewer overflow, they would talk about it and they would show that picture. But what's actually shown in that picture is not a combined sewer overflow. Um, when it rains and stuff goes through the rivers, rivers change color. All of the sediment stirs up and it gets carried um, out into the lake. So what you're looking at in that picture is actually a plume of river sediment. But that's the picture that the media always like to show anytime they said, oh, MMSD is having, they're dumping sewage, they're having a sewer overflow. Um, so I felt that I should uh, include that obligatory photo. So the next time you see it, um, you'll say, I've seen that before, I know the truth. So moving along, um, probably should have had a transitional slide here, but I did talk about the addition of all these impervious surfaces. And I know that the slide that's on the screen right now is kind of busy, but on the left kind of shows the way things used to be. Um, and the things to pay attention to here are the things in red. Before we built up all of these impervious surfaces in these buildings, uh, Mother Nature did a lot of good managing the water. Um, only 10% of it would actually run off. You know, about half of it would go into deep and shallow infiltration, and some of it would go back using a process called evapotranspiration back up into the atmosphere, into the natural water cycle. But on the right here is when um, things got built up, especially in that combined sewer area that I talked about, the numbers changed dramatically. Now we have to deal with you know, five times as much runoff because water is not going to pass through concrete very well. So we're only getting about 15% of that infiltration, um, not even as much evapotranspiration. And we've got to deal with all of this runoff. So it's another good reason to manage water where it falls. So I'm going to start talking about green infrastructure and um, to pay attention to on this slide, just like the last one, is the, those last few words that are in red. But green infrastructure has this big long definition um, in the Clean Water Act in section 502 about what it is. Um, but why are we interested in it? Because it can help reduce flows to sewer systems or to surface waters. Again, we're talking about managing water where it falls. I will talk more about what green infrastructure is but I don't necessarily like to use the big hairy um, definition out of the Clean Water Act. So what does green infrastructure do? Um, it helps us manage water where it falls, 
by mimicking or using nature's processes. And those processes are typically infiltrating into the ground or soaking into the ground, storing water, um, either in constructed wetlands or hydric soils, things like that, simply slowing it down or using plants to evapotranspire that water down into the ground and back up into the atmosphere. So this picture on the right here is actually uh, in downtown Milwaukee, uh, in the Pabst Redevelopment Area, um, not too far from the Milwaukee Public Museum, a little bit north and slightly west of there. And this is actually a bioswale, this device here. Um, this is actually the sidewalk side of it, but you can see that there's a curb cut here and, there's, and the street side of it looks very, very similar. And it's designed to take runoff off of all this impervious surface, draw it down into this engineered area to manage that water with the plants, soak some of it into the ground. And then when it gets high enough, it is going to go into this little bee's nest type of a grate here and ultimately into this, the combined sewer system, but not until it has to. So this is um, a, what a typical street bioswale looks like. Um, there are uh, quite a few different types of things that we consider green infrastructure at MMSD. And I've kind of color coded these because the ones that are in green are ones that conceivably you could do on your home at the residential scale. And that's really kind of what we're here to talk about. But MMSD, um, when we're talking about green infrastructure, we're talking to you know, municipalities, we're talking to nonprofit groups, we're talking to private developers, we're talking to um, the residential sector. So we talk different scale of green infrastructure to different audiences. So we have all of these types of programs and things going on to try to help manage where it falls. And I've just kind of got a smattering of photos on the screen here. So this is actually on top of Milwaukee Public Museum in their current location. Um, this is a green roof. So green roof does all kinds of stuff for the environment. And in fact, we have a, th that's how I got my start at MMSD um, on green infrastructure was primarily managing a green roof incentive program. And this is one of the roofs that was funded by that. Green roofs are kind of unique in that not only do they manage some stormwater, they do all kinds of stuff for buildings that most other green infrastructure doesn't. Um, so while they don't manage a great deal of stormwater, they have other benefits that make them worthwhile. And there's some porous pavement shown here on the lower left. Rain barrels are wildly popular. We have an extremely successful rain barrel um, program. And, and this is another picture of a bioswale over to the right. Um, during a rainfall. So you can see it's soaking up that rain somewhere in this nest of plants is a, is a drain that once it fills up too high, it will go to the storm sewer, but not again, not until it has to. So I'm gonna be talking about rain barrels and cisterns, primarily rain barrels. Um, cisterns sometimes are above ground, um, generally larger than a rain barrel, but not just as frequently they're underground. So they're not necessarily very practical at the residential scale. Uh, rain gardens. Um, I, porous pavement is two different colors because yes, you could do it at, at, on uh, your property. It's just not very common. And there are some reasons you might want to rethink doing that. And I'll talk about those. Um, I'm going to kind of combine native landscaping and rain gardens because both of them use um, native plants. And then of course, there's trees and, and soil amendments. So let's start with the rain barrels. Um, that's one of our coast guardian, our Fresh Coast intern team. Um, the last time we had a full-fledged team was 2019 before the pandemic happened. I'm going to scale that type of stuff back. But we typically work in some areas of Milwaukee every year. And then one of the Milwaukee suburbs um, doing residential scale green infrastructure outreach. Um, that includes things like rain barrel installations, uh, rain garden installations. Um, our interns are out at 
farmers markets, county fairs, stuff like that. Uh, talking about all the same sort of stuff that that I'm going to talk about, getting people to learn about green infrastructure and actually employ it on their property. So why would you want a rain barrel? Um, well, it does save you money by lowering your water bill to an extent that you're going to notice it. No, probably not. But it certainly is the gateway to green infrastructure. People like their rain barrels. When we do these programs and we do rain barrel workshops, we usually see that kind of as the gateway to teach people about other things that they can do. They're pretty easy to install. The water is great for your garden and, and your plants. Um, it's saving energy because it, it, you're getting that water from nature. It doesn't have any of the treatment chemicals in it, the fluoride or anything like that. Um, and you can use it for a number of things, washing windows, household chores. I don't really know anybody that does that, but you could. Typically, you're going to use that for watering stuff. And this particular rain barrel that's on the screen is the model that we've kind of finally settled on after six or seven different iterations of rain barrels since we started the program. Um, and it's very nice. It's very durable. Uh, you will notice here that you no longer have to cut your downspout and direct it into the rain barrel. There's a device that I'll talk about that makes it very easily to, easy to install. And this particular one has a reversible lid. So you can flip the top around and you can put some plants in it that are not fed by the barrel itself. You still would have to water them, but it makes it a little bit more decorative. And it's a very flexible um, type of barrel where you can reverse the spigot and the hose depending on whether you want to use a watering can or some type of a hose or how high you're going to mount the thing on a stand. So why else would I want one? Well, that particular model, this is a, this is a good picture because it shows a really typical installation um, where it's hooked into the downspout. Once the rain barrel is full, the water just keeps going down the downspout, but it shows the reversible lid. You could flip this over snap it on there and just use it as a conventional rain barrel if for some reason you didn't want to put plants in it. Most people seem to really like that planter feature. So it does lower the volume of water that's going to get in our sewers. It helps manage water where it falls. It's going to help reduce the stress on the sewer system, all that I talked about earlier. And then in turn, it will help reduce the risk to your home and your neighbor's homes from sewer backups significantly all by yourself? No, probably not. But again, I need to preach that collective action, every drop counts philosophy that we use. A little bit of rain barrel math. I don't want to make this overwhelming or go through all of these calculations on here. But people think, oh, good, I can manage all this water off my roof with a rain barrel. Well, not, not, not so much because rain barrel, um, this person here is, this is pretty phenomenal because they are cascading their barrels and they can manage probably 200 gallons here from what I can see, where one barrel fills, it fills the next one, fills the next one, fills the next one. But, you know, a typical 1,000 square foot roof, um, that's going to that's gonna produce 600 gallons of water during a, a one inch rainfall. If you get a downpour that, that could put 12 gallons of rain per minute through your downspout, you're gonna fill your rain barrel, your single rain barrel in as little as four or five minutes. So I just wanna give some perspective about what a rain barrel can do for you. Then we're gonna take a look at the, the Schultz family rain barrels. Um, so this is, this is my system. Um, I have older ones from several generations ago where I've converted, you know, I've reconditioned food grade barrels. Um, the newer barrel that, that I showed uh, a couple slides ago, you would never install it with this, ho this hole this much higher than the barrels. And I will talk about why uh, momentarily. But I, you know, being the green infrastructure and sewer nerd that I am, I like to keep track of how much water have I managed on my property. And so in 2021, um, I emptied these barrels 15 times because I have, a, I have four different pollinator gardens on my property now. 
Um, and I water them as much as I can, just exclusively using these two barrels. So these two are draining about 1,200 square feet of roof space. I measured that all out. I did some calculations. So in that rainfall, a severe downpour, eight minutes later after that rainfall, my barrels are full, just to give a little bit more perspective. Um, they're very easy to install. I won't go into great detail because I can see that it's 7.30. I lost a little bit of time to my technical difficulties. Um, and I wanna lose some time for questions. But people were always hesitant to install rain barrels and I was myself until this device came out, the diverter kit. Um, so all you need to do is these four easy steps. You need to find a good downspot where you have room to put a rain barrel. You, you set up your rain barrel. I'll talk about that a little, a little bit more, but you need a level spot on the ground. Um, we typically, the interns, when they install these, they will take a couple buckets of gravel, pound that down, uh, put, put a couple cinder blocks on there, make sure they're level, put all the attachments on the barrel, set it up, and then they'll do a measurement to estimate where that hole is going to go. And you drill a hole in the downspout and insert that device, and then you're good. Um, what that device does is when the water comes down your downspout, this outside funnel will direct water into the rain barrel. And once the barrel is full, water seeks its own level. It can't go into the barrel anymore. And it goes down the center hole, down the downspout where it would have gone anyways. Um, that's what convinced me, okay, now I'm willing to put some rain barrels on my house. Because if you cut, if, if you would install it the old fashioned way, put your downspout into the barrel, once the barrel is full, now you have to have an overflow out of your barrel to get that water to go somewhere. And typically some of the early rain barrels, the inlet was much larger than the overflow outfoot, out, outlet, um, which to me is bad, ma bad math. Sorry, I'm having some speaking problems. Um, if the water can't get out as fast as it comes in, it's gonna spill all over and you don't wanna put any water near the foundation of your house. So this is actually an old slide. Um, so that number is over 26,000 now. What the current number is, I couldn't get the new slide in time for this. Um, but when we do the math, um, we can manage every time it rains, if a barrel is empty, over a million gallons, just through that collective action of our rain barrel program. So, here are some of our handy dandy intern again from several years ago out doing their thing, um, installing a rain garden. You can see a recently reinstalled or recently installed rain garden in the foreground of the picture um, behind the sign that we always give a rain garden recipient that says our, 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 our yard helps protect Lake Michigan by managing water where it falls. You also see the rain barrel in the background and you know the native plants and stuff in the front. So why would you want a rain garden? Well, a lot, lot of reasons. To beautify your yard, reduce that stormwater runoff like a rain barrel only to a greater extent. You can combine that with a rain barrel because the down, water's coming from a downspout and it does all the same sort of stuff about reducing the runoff and the flooding and the drainage problems. Um, even better, it helps reduce the amount of lawn you need to mow, and it provides important habitat for birds and pollinators. Why else would you want one? Well, if you don't have to mow that lawn and you put a rain garden in and you're using natural landscaping and rain garden plants, these are plants that are typically native to the area and they've adapted to the local conditions. They're drought, somewhat drought resistant. That's why we use them. So that generally equals less maintenance than a bunch of annuals. Um, and in general, they do not need fertilizers, herbicides, or pesticides. So, so less chemicals, better for everybody. So some features of a rain garden. There's a couple of really nice pictures on the right hand side of the slide. This is a very prototypical rain garden, the teardrop shape, the berm on the one end, um, the plants kind of spaced out, you know, a depressed area that's been dug out. 
and then it's going to need a water source to get to it. So it's very typical um, to dig a shallow depression and then berm one side of it. It does need a water source to get to it. Bottom is generally flat and level, um, but you're going to need a water source to go to it. Very typically, that's going to be a downspout. Some people will, will have a sump pump, but then you need to know a little bit about your sump pump. How often does it run? What's the capacity? Just to figure out some calculations in order to, to size that rain garden appropriately. So you don't want to build a rain garden in a spot that's wet all the time because a rain garden is designed to take water that would flow off of somewhere else and stop it take it down into the ground as much as it possibly can. So if you've got a spot that's wet all the time, you might be able to put some native plants in there to help firm that ground up and, and soak some of that water up, but you would not wanna try and put a rain garden there because it already has drainage issues. Um, here's a completed rain garden. And there are some, some things that people need to consider. You never wanna put a rain garden within six to 10 feet of your foundation because the whole idea of this managing water where it falls is getting it away from your foundation. Um, so this is kind of a blended rain garden that, that is shown on this picture where some of this stuff is not actual rain garden. It's just some, um, some perennials, some daylilies, some typical shrubs and stuff like that but it's not necessarily part of the rain garden. The rain garden is just beyond that, but it's blended in with regular landscaping. So it's kind of hidden to give it a uniform look. But on both sides of this patio, this is like a dual rain garden. Um, you can see the downspout feeding into this little gravel area, which is actually feeding the rain garden portion. So that's one neat little trick we like to do to help people augment their um, their existing landscaping and kind of hide the rain garden if you don't want to just go out into the middle of the lawn and dig a hole in it and put the rain garden there. Um, this is really important where it says away from lateral. Your lateral is a pipe that's running from your house to the sewer system and you never want to put your rain garden right over your lateral because you don't want to draw water down into an area that's supposed to be moving water away from your house. Um, the older the house, the older the lateral. In parts of Milwaukee, um, sometimes that lateral is pretty long. It's made of clay, probably isn't water tight anymore. So you don't wanna bring water down on top of where that lateral is. So you want to stay several feet away from that as well. So that's a, that's a consideration. So um, this is one of my favorite rain garden pictures because it does complement existing landscaping. It, it's managing water on both sides of that walkway. And, it, and it's got a nice source of storm water. So native landscaping, why would you want to do that? Um, if you look back a couple slides ago, the same list as, as was up there for a rain garden. Um, but one of my favorites is it reduces that amount of lawn that you need to mow. And this is actually, um, one of my pollinator gardens. And you can see the, this providing pollinator and bird habitat, it, it's a real thing. It, in, it actually provides quite a bit of entertainment value for me, sitting out in my backyard during the summer, uh, just watching what's going on in my pollinator garden. So um, why do we use native plants? Well, they have some pretty um, impressive root systems. You know, as opposed to the right hand side here, while turf grass will stop erosion and it will hold your lawn or your dirt and your topsoil in place, it's not going to do much to manage water. And it's going to be pretty needy as far as needing water to survive because the roots are nothing compared to some of the typical types of native landscaping. Um, here's just some more illustrations of what I'm talking about. So this chart on the left here is showing, you know, different species of native plants. Some are recognizable. I realize that the scale, you really can't read it, but obviously some Echinacea purple cone flowers um, and things like that. But some of the roots will go down a full 15 feet 
to help down, especially in this Milwaukee area where we have lots of clay type of soils, to help break up that soil and draw some of that water down into the ground. And that picture on the right, I snagged that at Milwaukee Public Museum several years back. They had a display all about native plants and native prairie that showed actually some of the root systems and what they do. So they do an amazing job of surviving, adapting con to conditions and managing water. Um, this is just an illustration. This, this is a photo that I took in my uh, backyard because I was just amazed at these tiger swallowtails that were showing up. And I was bound and determined to get two of them in the same photo. And I, eventually I did. So when, I, but then when I blew this photo up, um, you know, there's a bee on the left, there's a bee on the upper right. There's a tiger swallowtail there, there's one there because they love those purple cone flowers. But then when I looked really closely, I didn't see the photo bombing hummingbird in the picture. Um, I've never seen so many hummingbirds as this, this year when um, all of my native plants that I planted last fall really took off. And these hummingbirds really love these royal catchfly and cardinal flowers and anything red um, really seems to draw them in. And they just kept coming back and coming back and coming back to the point where I could hear them before I could even see them sometimes. And I had no idea that this one was actually in the photo. A um, few things about trees. Uh, trees are obviously good for the environment and they're one of the types of green infrastructure that we count in some of our incentive programs because of all of the things they do. Um, they, will, they will put water up back into the atmosphere. You know, they create oxygen. Um, they draw stuff down through their root system. They shade your lawn and, and stop evaporation and help hold water where it falls and helps get, help get it into the ground. Trees just move water all over the place. So they, you know, the shade they offer helps us fight climate change. Um, we are not ashamed of using the term climate change at MMSD. Um, we believe it's real. Uh, we, don't, um, we don't mince words anymore. We, we, we believe in the science that shows when all of the most intense storms have happened in over the last 10 to 15 years um, compared to before that. So we use that term pretty freely. Some people are more um, hesitant to use that term, but not us. So um, we encourage trees. Some people, nonetheless, we all live um, in an area most, most likely where I do. I live in a subdivision down in Oak Creek and people love their lawns. It's, it's in their nature. People like green lawns. Um, neighbors like to outdo their neighbor next to them. So what can you do with your lawn if you're not going to do some of this native stuff? Well, you can cut your grass high. It shades the roots. Um, you fertilize properly using a natural type of fertilizer. Never cut more than one third of the blade because it keep your lawn high. It sh shades the roots, helps the water in place. It forces longer roots into the ground to help the grass survive better and draw more water down into the ground. And you can add soil amendments in, into your lawn to help turn your lawn from um, a minimal absorber of stormwater into a stormwater sponge. So we advocate for a process called soil amendments. That's a five-step process. You know, every other year, if you go through this process, it's really gonna help your lawn uh, go from shallow roots to deeper roots and get more water into the ground. So you mow fairly often, recycling your grass clippings, you dethatch de your lawn to pull that thatch layer out, aerate it, top dress it with compost, feed your lawn using a natural fertilizer like malorganite, um, and then overseed it. If you do that every other year, it is really gonna help your lawn um, thrive. People are always asking also about 
porous pavement and, per and permeable pavers. And on that slide a while ago, I had that um, partially green and partially blue because you can use porous pavement. Um, I have a very small walkway where I used it, but you're generally not gonna use that to manage a whole bunch of water on your property. It is, it's a little, it's more expensive. Um, it's typically used in a setting like this. I believe this photo is actually from the North Point Lighthouse where it's used in conjunction with some underground storage. And most people are not, are not going to have this type of engineered stuff on their household or on their property. Um, a couple quick plugs. The rest of the slides are gonna go very quick because I wanna allow some time for questions, but we do have a program that I manage called the Green Infrastructure Partnership Program or the GIPP, which is a competitive um, matched incentive funding program for um, public, private and nonprofit sector within our green infrastructure service area, which is actually just Milwaukee County minus South Milwaukee. But if people work within that area and you learn about green infrastructure um, and, and wherever it is that you work, say, hey, I just learned about this program. Um, it opens once a year, it'll open in January. And we ba basically reimburse these projects based on the amount of gallons of stormwater that we can store on their project um, at a rate of about $1.95 per gallon for most of the green infrastructure types. So if you work in Milwaukee, now you're all enthused about green infrastructure. Um, this program will open up again in January. Um, little plug for our Fresh Coast Resource Center. Um, I, I don't know if the phone number shows up on here or not, but it is 414-225-2222. And we do have a virtual presence, uh, www.freshcoastguardians.com. Um, we will talk to you about green infrastructure. We give general green infrastructure assistance. We have a series of workshops that we do, some that are restricted registration to just within our service area. Um, we do have the grant program and we like to, um, we like to incorporate workforce development and training in green infrastructure in our incentive program and through some of our other programs as well. One thing that is not restricted to our service area is our wildly popular rain garden plant sale. Um, I do not have, all, the dates have XX in here because I do not know firm dates just yet, but sometime in late February, we will open up a virtual store um, that can be accessed either through mmsd.com or freshcoastguardians.com where we work with um, Agricol, a regional uh, native plant specialty nursery. And we offer them rain garden plants at a, up to 50% off of retail. That's where I got all of my plants. Um, the sale was so popular last year, we had to have two pickup dates for our spring sale. And then we added a fall sale. We're not gonna be able to do that next year. So if you're a native plant buff, and you want to get plants through our sale, um, you're going to want to order early because we can only bring so many plants in. You order your plants online and then um, pay for them through the online store. And there is a designated pickup date where you have to come get them from us at MMSD headquarters. That is usually the first or second week in June on a Saturday. Um, Typically that rain garden plant sale is preceded by some virtual webinars. Again, some of those are restricted registration to in our service area because that's how we're funded. However, many of them are then hosted on either the Milwaukee Public Library's YouTube channel or our YouTube channel because people record them and post them. So if, you, if for some reason you wanna to try to attend one of those and you can't get in, you can find them out um, on the virtual space. Another thing we have is you can text um, for a water drop alert. If you text the word water drop to the number that's on the screen, uh, anytime 
that conditions are ripe where we, we encourage people to use less water because it's a heavy rainfall, we will send out a text alert because again, there's only so much room in the sewer system and the storm sewer system as well. So if we're worried about capacity in our sewer system, anyone that signed up to that gets a, hey, could you please hold off and use less water? Don't run your dishwasher till tomorrow. Don't do that load of laundry till you have to because collective action, every drop helps. Um, if you're in Milwaukee County, um, we have household hazmat collection sites that are open year round. There's a, a couple of them out there that can be found on our website because we would rather have stuff disposed of properly than either thrown in the garbage or worse yet, foreign, poured down the drain or the toilet, because then it will go to one of our water reclamation facilities that is not designed to handle that. We have a campaign called What's Your Why? What inspires you when it comes to water and why do you love to protect Lake Michigan? And probably for most of you, that would be the Fox River and the Gulf of Mexico ultimately. Um, but on our website, which is freshcoastguardians.com, on the front page of that, you can click on the, on the wear your support icon, which may or may not show up, it does in this And um, if you're within our service area, you submit a reason why you want, why you feel managing water where it falls is important, why you wanna protect surface waters. And we will send you one of these t-shirts that the interns wear that says, I help protect Lake Michigan on the back. Unfortunately, if you're not in Milwaukee County, something's gonna pop up and says, after you've done all that work, something's gonna pop up and says, sorry, you're out of our service area. Um, the other thing that you could do though, to find out when our plant sales and that type of stuff is, is on our website up in the upper right, you can sign up for our Fresh Coast News, which we send out periodically to alert people of events and other type of information. That being said, I, did, I do want to allow at least a couple minutes for questions. So Joanna, you are the moderator of questions. I am, I am. This was fascinating. Thank you so much. I learned so much. In fact, I told you I had teenagers in the room with me, like they kept coming <laughs> over to look at your slides. So I think they may pull that up later. Um, all right, so there were actually several questions around the rain barrels. So okay. um, are the rain barrels available for sale if you're not in the service to, um, area? Yes, they are. Um, we, don't, we, we don't nitpick on that. We do have some workshops where people have a chance to, all, to learn about Things. It's like a timeshare. If you want a free rain barrel, you got to listen to us talk to you about how great we are for sure. a little while. <laughs> um, but you can purchase one from MMSD um, out of our lobby at 260 West Seabooth. They're $60 for the barrel and the diverter kit included. Um, there are some great videos on freshcoastguardians.com that show how to install them. You can always call us or email us through the contact us feature if you have questions on how to install them. But you're going to want to buy that rain barrel before Christmas of this year because like everything else, the supply chain has messed up our rain barrel program. Prices are going up and we're probably not going to be able to sell them beyond the end of this year until we reevaluate next year. But yes, you can be outside of our service area and buy a rain barrel. Oh, wonderful. And do you happen to know off the top of your head how many gallons are in those rain barrels? You, they're about 50 to 52 gallons or okay. so. Um, right. The specifications for the rain barrel are actually on freshcoastguardians.com and you just follow the path to the rain barrel page Perfect. and you can right. click and it will tell you dimensions and stuff. Okay, awesome. And then, and one last rain barrel question from Connie. Uh, do you know if there's an 80 gallon rain barrel available? Uh, there may be, but not from us. Okay. But there are websites out there because one of the things that happens to us is people are always calling saying, I lost my winterizing cap. Because at the end of the year, you unplug <laughs> your rain barrel and that hole that you drilled, it mm -hmm. comes with a cap that you just put in there using the same two screws. And we say, 
we're sorry about that. We don't have any spares, but here's where you can get them. Okay. Um, and one of the places is called rainbarrelparts.com. Um, but they also sell a host of different rain barrel size and manufacturers and stuff like that. So that's one place I would look. Okay, perfect. All right, then there was a question that came in um, from Joe. So when you were talking about your service area, his question was, so South Milwaukee, Milwaukee has the Wheat Energy's coal plant, is that correct? And then does South Milwaukee handle any, treat that water that comes out of there? Well, that's actually located in Oak Creek, not too far from where I am right now. Uh -huh. And so any of the water that they discharge from their processes comes to MMSD, to our South Shore Water Reclamation Facility, typically. But a lot of the water, they discharge, you know, the permitted stuff, depending on what the process is that they're using it for, is actually discharged right back into the lake. If it's non-contact cooling water and it's not mixed in with a process or something where chemicals are added, it's allowed to go back out to the lake. But okay. the stuff that doesn't, it comes to us. Okay. Yeah. And then um, who reports water quality and how often are reports issued? That was another question from Joe. So. Well, uh, uh, that's a somewhat complicated <laughs> answer um, because I believe a host of different entities will report out on, on water quality. However, um, MMSD does have a water quality monitoring group that monitors with regularity um, the surface waters, including the estuary and different parts of the lake. So there is a wealth of data that MMSD collects. Does it get publicly reported out on, on a regular basis? I don't believe it does. I don't know off of the top of my head how much of that, that data or how much of those data are available on our website, but you could look there. But entities like um, Milwaukee Riverkeeper mm -hmm. is an organization that, that reports out on water quality. I believe probably the DNR does things of that nature as well. Um, but I don't believe it's something that we regularly do. Okay. And then um, there was a lot of conversation about this because we are the permaculture and gardening group, there was a lot of advice for Kelly. Um, Kelly wanted to know if there's any specific recommendations for leaves. So she said she tends to leave leaves on her lawn because she's heard that they're really good um, for pollinators, overwintering, local ecosystems, but um, and that they'll eventually compost. But is there anything else that she should do with them? I know Milwaukee County probably are picking up leaves so they don't end up in uh, waterways, correct? Um, well, um, city of Milwaukee probably does, especially in that combined sewer area because they want to keep them out of the stormwater system. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have that sort of collection in Oak Creek where I live. On our Milorganite website, so there's three websites. You know, there's freshcoastguardians.com, there's mmsd.com, and because we manufacture Milorganite, our organic or our natural fertilizer, um, there is a video there that talks about soil amendments, which I talked about earlier. And their recommendation is to mow them over and cut them down so they're about the size of a quarter and use them as either compost in your native plant garden or leave them on your lawn and break them down that way. Um, don't recommend burning them or anything because they are a resource. So I will sometimes throw them into a trash can, take my weed whacker, try and chop them up. And I have a compost bin out back and I'll throw them into there. I'll mix some of them into my, um, into my native, my pollinator gardens, which I have more and more of every year because I'm hooked on it. And um, some of them I'll just leave on the lawn. Mm -hmm. So the more that you can manage them in place, the, the better. Okay. And, and th <laughs> those were the answers that we got from the permaculture gardening group too. So, so it's great um, to yeah, hear the recommendations are the same. So uh, Excellent. 
Yeah. So does anyone have any last minute questions that they want to throw out there? Otherwise, we are going to thank Chris. So um, I, I think I got to most to all of the questions here. So Okay. Well, Chris, this has been wonderfully, wonderfully educational. We cannot thank you enough for um, spending the evening with us and all the preparation that went into this on your end. And thank you just for dedicating your career to this. This has been fantastic. So it's it's been a great career and it's probably got a couple of years left in it yet. So yeah. um, I would encourage people, you know, to visit any of those three websites. And, it, and if you want to learn more, there are some links to some of the workshops on some of those websites, but an easy way to find them also is to go on to just youtube.com and do a search on MMSD rain garden installation, or even better yet, Milwaukee Public Library has several of them because I checked that earlier today. Just go on their YouTube channel and search within their U YouTube channel for um, rain garden workshop. A lot of these we do with Melinda Myers too. Mm -hmm. So, so you get some really expert advice from her. Yes, we love Melinda. We've, we've uh, just had her out at our sustainability fair. It was fantastic. So, all right. Hey, well, Joanna, jo yes. Joanna, real quick, this is Judy. I just wanted to give a shout out that I have used um, the Fresh Coast Guardians. Um, I've done their workshops on the rain garden. I have a rain barrel from them. And I have a rain garden that I put in um, last fall from, from all the plants that they had. And the plants were really good quality and they, they all survived. And probably I planted more than I should have. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but um, I just highly recommend the, the workshops and the videos that are out there to, to learn more. So that's all. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank yep. you so much, Judy. Come down and get your rain barrels before Christmas and order early from the plant sale. Yeah, that's probably the best advice. Those two pieces, that's what we'll leave everybody with. So, all right. Thank you, Chris. Good night, everyone. Okay, good night. Thank you. Thank you.